Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome to this evening's webinar in the Practical Management Skills Series, and it's called How to Build and Lead High-Performance Teams. My name's Anne Halloran, and my company is Intuition, and I set it up in 1989, and I've been fortunate over the years to work across just about every business sector, uh, from large organizations down to micro enterprises, helping them with their learning and development. And I've spent a lot of time in the whole area of leadership and management training. And as a result of my work, I put together a website called practicalmanagementskills.com a few years back. And in that, you'll find lots of practical tips on how to manage yourself and others in the workplace. And an offshoot of my website is that I run regular webinars. And so here we are this evening, and I'm very delighted um, to introduce, introduce our guest presenter, David Grundy. Good evening, David. Hi, Anne, and good evening, everybody. You're very welcome. Now, I'll hand over to you, maybe, David, and if you'd like to introduce yourself and maybe start Hi, the uh, webinar. <coughs> yeah, um, my mum calls me David, and all my friends call me Dave, so please call me Dave. And um, a little bit about my background is... is basically up there on the screen, um, but I'm the Managing Director of Two of the Achievements. Uh, I am a Chartered Accountant, a Business Coach and Mentor, and uh, I spent about 23, 23 years in the military, and I worked across a breadth of organizations from frontline units to hospitals, training centers, and higher formations, and I specialized in multi-project teams and multi-million pound investment appraisals. Uh, later, I moved into the private sector, and I've worked in companies from small timber companies up to um, large IT program uh, developments and uh, one organization, that's wide area networks, sorry. And in the public sector, I've focused on logistics and on regional um, development agencies. Um, uh, the regional development agency team uh, was the last team I worked with and that was a really special place for me. Uh, and the people were there were really amazing and exciting a really positive culture with a can-do attitude, uh, with a wide, wide range of skills and qualifications from professional communications to infrastructure, enterprise, science and innovation, strategic planning and economics. And it, as I say, it was really exciting to see the planning and the delivery of this multiple programs and projects and be part of it. So that's a little glimpse of who I am. But tonight's not about me, it's all about you. So, coming on to this next slide, um, prepare to check that uh, you're not here for the knitting class and that you are here for this webinar, which is about, excuse me, <coughs> practical management skills and building um, high performance teams. Um, so, who's it for? Um, and I believe that in any organization or in a business or a not for profit sector that wants to flourish and grow, uh, you need great leaders and managers and teams. And also, there are clear benefits from having some financial awareness and understanding to their skills. So having that team around you, whether you're a leader or a manager, or one of the players, or you, you might be a single man band. And you say, well, I'm not in a team. Well, if you've got alliances, partners, suppliers, clients, and customers, then you are, in effect, in a team. So there are many, many kinds of teams, and we'll be talking about that later in this uh, webinar. So uh, I put together a brief agenda, which I'll just trot through, and I'll be get putting this back up um, just to remind ourselves where we are, and I will be taking some questions as we go through. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. I've been suffering with a, uh, a man cold for a few weeks. So um, the five things we're going to cover are winning teams, the leader role. I'll be telling you a true story, so um, stay tuned for that. And right towards the end, I'll be giving you some powerful and simple tools, tips, and techniques that really do work. And then finally, I'll be sending you an invitation to explore. But more of that at the end of tonight's agenda. So what is a team? And I thought, well, in the best, um, in the best laid plans of taking exams, start with the definition. So I went on to the CIPD website, 
and I'd ask you just to take a, a minute to read this definition. Yeah, so that's quite a long one. So I thought, well, how can we say that a little bit more succinctly? So, but tonight I'm going to use this definition, and I hope you're happy with it. And I think a team is a group of people all working together for a common goal to agreed standards. I hope that makes sense to you. So, here's a question for you, and perhaps we could take some points on the uh, on the chat line here. And so, um, talk about how many types of teams can you list? So, more to the point. In, in, what kind of team are you in at the moment? That might be another way of putting that. So perhaps you could just put a few tips, a uh, few um, points on the chat line. And let's see what kind of teams we can come up with tonight. Okay, David. Yes, there's some interesting teams coming up here. A lot of project teams, by the sounds of things. Um, someone here is mentioning that they're in a self-managed team, which is uh, you know, it's, that's not something you hear a lot of, but they're great when they do happen. You need to have a great atmosphere of trust, I think, if you're going to have a self-managed team. Indeed, um, yeah, yeah, you very self-disciplined there. Uh, and, and some people even say, oh, they're in a soccer team. So I suppose what, it's, what, what this is telling us is that, you know, teams come from not just in the workplace, but, uh, you know, outside work as well. You know, and, and most of us are in some kind of a team, even if we realize that or not. Absolutely, and it's like a lot of things. When you stop and you ponder and review, you think, actually, yeah, there are lots of teams. For example, I used to be in the Lions Club, and we had a team to put on various um, fundraising events, and that's a team too, isn't it? Yes, okay, well, we move on then, Dave, I think. I think so, yeah. So let's, first of all, ask ourselves, what are the characteristics of a winning team? So I've tried to put them down to the, these three core areas. Um, so what does that winning team look like? So understanding the, the bigger picture. And so what do I mean by that? So let's contrast um, one team perhaps working in a vacuum where they only know what it is that they do compared to another team where they understand completely the context that they're working in. They know what the impact of any of their work or their decisions is going to have on other parts of the organizations or their clients or customers or partners and, and that they understand the relevance of the job outcome and their effectiveness. But I think the benefits are uh, it promotes collaboration within the team by working together and it increases the level of commitment and quality and people are really thinking about what it is they're doing. They've got a greater understanding. So that's about the bigger picture. So moving on to um, trams, as I put it there, and common goals, um, th this is something I did in some research about a year or so ago. I came across it on a USA uh, website, and it sort of resonated with me, pardon the pun. Um, now, we all know SMART goals, that's um, specific, measurable, achievable, um, and you can, and going through on to timeliness. But in this one, we're looking at um, something that's thrilling, something that excites the whole team, um, and something that really rings bells or resonates with them, um, and something that's uh, accountable. And uh, obviously, we need to be able to measure the level of success. And that will. The nice thing about this technique, it leads into that specific objective and that goal, and gives you metrics that the whole team can see and work to. And they can use that to determine the effectiveness of the team and any improvements they've made. So moving on to the final one, which is works collaboratively as a, collaboratively as a unit. I guess it's sort of fallen out of the other two, really, hasn't it? Uh, an effective team, it, it clearly works together. And it's obvious to people either working in the team or looking at the team. And they've got this sense of interdependency. Um, for example, uh, near where I, I live in Peterborough, um, there's a, a company, huge company called Perkins Engines, and anyone who works in agriculture will have heard of these engines. And just imagine you're working on the line there, you're charged, of, you say, well, I'll produce as many engines as I like, and you, you're going as fast as you can. 
But the poor old boys and girls in the packing room, dispatch room, they've only got a certain size of room. They can only take so many. There's a real need to know what's going to go on down the line. Does that make sense? So one of the impacts of working as a collaborative unit is uh, the changes in behavior from this negative blame culture um, to one of being helpful and one of learning and development and moving on towards growth. And I'm sure you can imagine times when you've seen a really good team working and similarly you might think of a good time and another time when you've seen it not working so well. And it's, you can use that, that's another technique for looking at how to improve something. Look at how, just imagine what it's like when it doesn't work well. And then just reverse the polarity effect. So let's move on to team leader role and competencies. So let's start off with many of you guys will be leaders or managers in your team. And I just wonder what it's like for you. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to um, SMEs and uh, non-for-profit organizations and, and I talk to managers and the image I'm sometimes, well, often getting is people, they start off really well organized, they're thinking about things, they've got a list to do, they've got a priority list and then as they're driving into work and um, with modern technology they're getting emails, they're getting texts and they're walking and all these sort of things are flying at them, you know, a priority incoming. There's an urgent deadline, just come in boss, you need to look at it now. There are staff issues, someone's not well or something's happened in the team. And then in comes a key customer wanting to know what's gone wrong with their order. Or many things like that. I'm sure you've got your own list out there. And the point is, you carry forward that to-do list to tomorrow. And you haven't even started to work on the business, you're busy working in it. So, so when I ask these people um, the question, you know, in one word, how would you um, describe things? I hear things like people are pressurized, distracted, diverted, ignored. Or if it's going well, I'm hearing calm, focus, a happy atmosphere. People are engaged, obviously working together, and it's stress-free. So moving on to the competent team builder and leader. I think it's worthwhile looking at the key word in there, and I think the key word there is actually competent, and we're talking about competences. Uh, and here I've, I've, I've labeled three, uh, and the first one is promotes understanding. So why does a team actually exist? What's its purpose? Um, I'm currently working with a, pro a project team, and we're building a website for a charity that I do some work with. And um, I sent out a calling notice this very afternoon, and I said the purpose of the meeting is for us to deliver a specification for the website so that we can help the organization grow and do more what it does for the local community. People know why they're coming and what we're going to do. We're going to build a specification and ultimately deliver a new website. So that's promoting the understanding. And, and things that we can use are things like team visions and goals. And understanding what the critical success factors are and what each team member actually brings to the team. Because even in a small team, and I've led teams from five up to 60, um, I found that even in a team of five, um, different people brought different things and had different strengths that I could call upon. And, and in those areas, they were wonderful. So let's move on to the next one, which is ensure team's knowledge. Uh, and for me, this includes skills. And that must be adequate for the task. It includes information that's actually relevant to the team's goals and objectives and competences. And then finally, um, still on that slide, um, facilitating interaction. Um, and by that I mean building rapport, getting conversations going, uh, creating trust and motivation within the team. And it's all about aiding problem solving, decision making, and that coordination of effort instead of everybody growing and pulling in different directions. And one way I've heard it described is a team that's looking out for each other as well as focusing on their task in hand, creating an exciting and a passionate conversation that delivers high impact. So I was wondering, how can I put this? Sorry, Anne, I think you were a slide ahead of me there. I'm on building blocks for the leader. Okay, sorry. 
That's okay. Um, and, and the building blocks for the leader. I was trying to think, um, how can I, what can I give you guys? That's one slide that would be useful as an aid memoir. Um, <clears throat> so another way to look at the leader is to look at what the team are looking for. And um, from my experience of listening to people and seeing good teams working, um, they're looking for someone that they get on with. That, in other words, they've got rapport with, uh, who's, who's, who actively listens to them, who tunes into them, encourages, supports, advises, also challenges, and, and he knows them, and he knows what motivates them, and more importantly, what doesn't. And moving on to earning trust, it's not automatic or instant. It's earned by demonstrating your beliefs, your values, your attitude, and demonstrating knowledge and willingness to learn from the team. Uh, and it's about setting an example of your own personal behavior and work standards. And some of that came across to me as well with people it's in this trust. It's about people who know that you will be discreet, you will deliver on integrity, honesty, and probably really important one here is you will be consistent. It's really hard for a work for a boss, isn't it, who comes in one day in a real happy mood and I want to be your mate, and the next day they come in and say, who are you talking to? It just puts everybody off balance. People are looking for regular, regular people who have a consistent approach that they have familiarity with. So moving on to um, the challenge, uh, sorry, the goals and objectives. Um, again, I'll be talking later about creating team vision, goals, objectives, so the team members should see that their goals are all interlinked. Moving on to challenges, the, the team leader, you need to challenge the team to work to their agreed goals, standards, attitudes and behaviours. You know, you're there to do a job and actually, in my experience, challenging people when they say to you, can you tell me what to do here, and say, well, what do you know? What do you think? And actually, people are surprised how much they really do know. They just need a bit of confidence, um, um, a bit of a helping hand, encouragement, um, and saying, well, you can do this. And likewise, if they're, if they're coming up with an objection, there's nothing wrong with challenging people to say, well, what's that based on, in a grown-up way? And then finally, motivates and inspires. How have you been motivated and inspired when you've worked in a team? And you're all in teams now, so what's motivating you and what's inspiring you? And again, understanding of other people's beliefs and values. I'm a strong believer everything is built on the beliefs and values. And people who have common values and beliefs tend to work an awful lot better together. And finally, at the bottom there, there's a little phrase. Uh, it comes from my time with Lions Club International. And anyone who's a member will recognize that as one of the ethics. And uh, I've carried this forward into my work life, personal life. And I, I, I work very hard um, at um, being careful with my criticism and liberal with my praise. And I found that to date it's worked well for me and my teams. Thank you, Ryan. Is that a good point to ask if there are any questions um, that have come up on, on the chat line? Okay, yes, if you'd like to uh, put up any questions, please do so. And maybe if I can just add in something here now. I, I was fortunate enough to work with a really good leader at one point. And I, when I was observing him, you know, he was the kind of guy that he didn't just focus in on the task. And a lot of people can get very task-focused and deadlines and targets. And they kind of forget about the people aspect of the whole project. And this particular guy I work with, he, he kind of drew out an organizational chart of who was who, but it wasn't so much of, of what role they had, but how they interacted with each other, you know, which people had the influence, where were their kind of maybe uh, personality clashes, or maybe there, there could have been egos that might have had an, an impact on the, uh, the, the, the goals. So he, it, to me, he took a 3D look at the whole project, not just the task, but the people as well. And, uh, you know, I think you really, ha you know, I really learned a lot from him. And I think you have to really treat everybody as an individual, as you said earlier. Uh, you can't, yeah. there isn't just one right way of leading. And every individual needs leading in a different way. Yeah, and, and, and even individuals need a different style of management at different times and subject to diff what's going on around them at that moment, don't they? Yes. It depends now, on the urgency of things. 
Yes, okay, well one good question that came up, how do you manage a team that's working in a lot of rem remote locations and uh, it's hard to get them all together? That's a good question, actually um, I've had experience of that, um, I'm currently working with, excuse me, <coughs> the Cambridge Consultancy in Counselling and uh, this is an organisation where people who are self-employed counsellors come together and they provide uh, low-cost counselling for people that are struggling to pay the normal rates and uh, it's making that accessible. Now these people are spread all across Cambridgeshire and um, we have to we work in this, it's almost like a cooperative type organisation, it is actually a, a formal charity. So how do we work together? Well for example um, we have regular meetings um, only yesterday, or this morning rather, I was having a meeting with um, the, the chair and we were using Skype. So there's modern technology there now that uh, in the old days it used to be a phone call and, and that was better than nothing at all. Skype brings in the visual and as we all know, when you actually can see somebody, there's an awful lot more goes on in the communication. Wouldn't you agree, Anne? Uh, absolutely. You know, you do have to pick up the whole body language and you have to kind of feel the, the emotion behind what a person is saying as well and you're, it's much easier to do that when you can see them. Yeah. I mean, we've got a team meeting coming up and, and one person, um, and this is real, um, can't make the meeting. So, uh, But they, they can contact us by Skype. Now we're having the meeting in my living room, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect my laptop up to my TV so the rest of us can see the big screen but I've put the camera so that it's focused on the rest of the team. So that person is actually about, hmm, about 50 miles away, but they'll be able to be part of the team. And as the chair of the group, I'll make sure that if they've got any questions, I'll, I'll make sure especially that I keep going back to them to make sure that they feel part of it, even if they can't be part of it. So that's just one way, and I'm sure people can come up with other suggestions as well. Okay, that's great. Well, we move on then, Dave. Okay. So this brings me to um, a true story, uh, and I'd like to talk about um, a situation um, that I was in. Um, it was a large public organisation, and the, the figures on the, the screen tell the story themselves. £160 million budget, that's capital and revenue, and they had five large programmes, and the programmes themselves were then broken down into activities, and the activities beneath them were beneath the activities were literally thousands of projects. So there's an awful lot going on, and the, to make that happen, there were multiple teams. For example, let's just think about it. There was a board, there was an executive team, there were directors, there were budget and program managers, there were project officers, and there was another team that was responsible for the ongoing project monitoring to make sure that organizations who did have a grant, because it was a grant giving organization from the public sector, and that they actually were um, working to the agreed terms that they've been given with the grant. And of course one of the teams that was involved was the finance team, and I was the, um, the finance resource manager. My role there was actually to bring together the, all these multiple teams and the finance team because um, we're, they were doing really well, delivering some fantastic stuff. Um, but one of the problems that they'd come across was um, there seemed to be a lack of accuracy or robustness in the end of year forecasting because um, for those people not familiar with the public sector, uh, basically there's a use it or lose it. So they fought hard to get the funding and wouldn't it be a pity if you, because certain projects fell off or, or failed to deliver. Wouldn't it be a, a, a pity if we didn't use all those resources to actually make an impact in the region? Uh, and this was a regional development agency and I remain very proud of what they did. And I do remember what they said and it really resonated again with my beliefs and values to make the region a better place to live, work and visit. A tremendous team and they were doing really well. But we thought we could do better because the forecast, just before the end of the year, we were saying we're on target, literally two weeks before. Then one week after, unfortunately, something slipped off the radar and we were at risk 
of um, losing some of some of the um, spending um, ability that we have, uh, and that's not something that we'd want to do. So, what do we do about it? Well, this left forecasting confidence low, and we all know what it's like if you've been given some information, you're not really sure if you can depend on it or not. I mean, people are giving it with the best um, intentions, and uh, no one was throwing any porky pies or anything. It was what they thought. Um, but there's a clear disconnect between the what I would call the front line of the organisation, who whose natural forecast uh, focus rather was on the program and the project delivery, and quite understandably so. That's the entire reason that the organisation was there. Um, but the the risk, of course, was failing to maximise on that delivery. So what could we do about it? Thank you, Anne. So what was my task? Uh, well, my task was to improve the financial spending forecast and try and make it robust and uh, so that we could maximize that use of those financial resources that we were speaking about a few minutes ago and to improve communication between the finance team and also the, those, the front, what I call the, the frontline users. Now, so how did I do that? Um, well, the first thing I did was actually engage, sorry Anne, can I just stay with that slide just a moment longer, is that okay? Thank you. Um, I think the first thing I did was I faced the harsh facts that there is a clear gap between what we in the finance team were reporting and the actual outturn, the reality of the figures at the end of the year. Thanks Anne. So having faced that fact, I decided to, and I put on here quite deli deliberately, um, active change management, something I had to change. Um, because as it was, at the end of the year, um, we did ma manage to uh, manage the pipeline, but it was um, a lot of activity in a short period of time. It was very tense and it was very quick decisions, and uh, decisions made under pressure. And of course, it did impact on our partners, which was something we'd want to avoid. And also on the people who were, our partners being the funding partners. And it impacted on, the, uh, on, on our clients, the people at the front end who actually want, who come into the, the agency for the funding. And uh, we were saying, can you start this, can you start this, at an incredibly short notice. So, it, you know, we wanted to remove these irritations from them. So, how could we do that? And it was about improving communication all the way down the line. So we started by focusing on building rapport and trust. And I started having conversations with the key stakeholders. And I asked them some pretty basic questions, to be honest. Uh, but my objective was not to go in there and say, this is what we need in finance, but was to improve my understanding so that I could engage better. So I asked questions like, what's important to them? What were they setting out to achieve? Um, and I, I pointed out the harsh reality if, if the forecast was failing and the impact it was having on them and their team and diverting them from their primary task. Um, and then once I understand better what they were trying to do, then I was in a position to go away and identify areas how we could improve their forecasting and by producing reports which were more specific to their needs and more appropriate. And we also introduced some um, finance trainings, and some of that was in groups, some of it was in one-to-ones. Uh, and again, we designed these useful reports. I think one of the key things that we did was um, we got finance out of the finance office as well. And um, I arranged for members of my team to get a little bit closer to the organization by going and sitting in and working in the teams. It's a very simple thing. Instead of having um, desktops, I asked all my teams to have laptops so that we could move around and they could be mobile. Very simple thing had a huge impact. It meant they could walk over to the other parts of the building, log on to do their day-to-day -day work there, and sit in the team and get to know them. I started talking about ordinary things like 
did you see the game last night and building up relationships. So does that make sense? So what was the result of all that? Well, the following year, the budget was balanced within 0.5%. And there was less strain, less hassle. It was um, all, a whole lot calmer. During the year, the, uh, the management team um, developed two key boards, which actually lo looked at the revenue position overall and the capital position. And we developed, as a team, and, and I was just a member of that team, um, more of a pipeline approach so that we could slip and we had a closer attention on what what was likely to go wrong and if we could add an early indication of that we could start managing the pipeline that bit earlier and as a result the reputation of the organization grew with our stakeholders and the finance team and I should say the guys and girls in the program and the project team and uh, they felt valued and respected morale was just a little bit higher and life was a lot easier. And it was a great result. So now I come to item number four and I promised at the beginning of this that I would uh, give you some powerful and simple tools, tips and techniques that really work. Um, and I want to start by ensuring that we all have a common understanding of the question you're trying to answer. The, that's probably the, the absolute starting point in all of it. Make sure that you're, you're actually maximizing the use of your resources, delivering results. So one of the things that you might have seen on those slides, if you looked quite carefully, was a star. Uh, I came across this a number of years ago, and I'm still quite surprised when people don't know about it. It's just a very simple acronym, um, STAR, which stands for, as it says, uh, Situation, Task, Action, Results. So. Um, I use this for people who I know are going through interviews because we all get excited in interviews um, and we get asked this question, can you tell me a time when? And if you got this, yeah, there was a situation where I was doing this, my task was, the actions I took were, and the result was. And I just used that in talking to you about what we did in the regional development agency in the, in the multiple teams that we worked in. So that's start, that's just one tool. Um, I thought it would be useful to have something, a, a sort of visual aid to remind people um, that the, the team builder model. And so in building rapport, we're looking at listening, looking and observing, learning from your team, and engaging with your team. Um, and that's the, the more you know your team, the better you're able to manage them in the most appropriate way. And then earning trust. We, talk, we talked about honesty, integrity, professionalism, consistency, um, and um, it's, it's simple things like, you know, our teams don't always get it right. Well, let's not beat them up all the time. It's not a blame culture. Um, and those occasions, I would say, okay, leave it with us. Thank you very much. But you've got to stand up for your team. And then perhaps privately go away and have a word and say, so what went wrong there? What can we do to prevent that happening again? And in my experience, you, you deal with people as adults, and guess what? They respond as adults. Um, moving on to motivation. Um, I can't emphasize this enough, really. Just recognize that your team are different people. And you mentioned it earlier on. I totally agree. You know, do, it's, it's not taking time out. It's investing time and to find out what really motivates the team. Find out a little bit more. Than, have a coffee break. Have a chat get to know them a little bit. Um, it only needs 10 minutes, but it just makes you that much more approachable, especially if they've got a problem. And to inspire your, your people, I think you, know, you don't have to do heroic things. I just think you have to do simple things really well. Um, and, can, and, and your team are watching you from the minute you get in your car park to the minute you go home. And even when you're out socializing together, the team's watching you and how you behave. So be aware of that and lead by example at, at all times. And because um, you don't, it's not just a matter of saying, here is the system, work to it. You've got to live to it yourself. So that's about team builder model. Now, I'm a strong believer, I heard years ago, that um, um, people uh, are happy to jump on a boat, provided that they're, a uh, rocky boat even, provided that they're happy that the, the, the person 
who is steering the boat is capable of steering it and has a clear direction uh, of where they're going and the team believe that they're going to get them there. So um, one of the, the, the things that we did after in the past in numerous teams is start by creating a team vision statement. So having got them into context for the overall organizational vision, and the, it's very useful to have a team vision. So how do we fit into that? What's our vision for working towards that? Uh, the team charter, uh, again, it, it's very useful this for, um, for creating the right climate and culture in your team. And it includes values, uh, principles, behaviors, and attitudes and you know how are we going to behave and are we going to have charter house rules and, and for those that don't know charter house rules it means if we're going to have a meeting and you're going to talk about something what goes on in the meeting stays in the meeting and if you've got a point you make it in the meeting you don't go away afterwards and have a post meeting and start moaning about the decision it's about what's in the meeting room and contributing you know and listening and letting everybody have their fair shout because some people are bigger shouters than others, aren't they? So that's the that's the role of the chair. And some people in the in the group may be a gatekeeper. They may may be good at saying, "Well, Fred hasn't said anything at all. Is there anything you want to say, Fred?" And it's amazing when Fred gets a chance, what he knows. So the team's uh, goals and objectives. Again, I've spoken about that. Having clear goals that fit into the team leaders goals, that fit into the team goals, that fit into the organizational goals. And by having their own individual goals and objectives, that dovetailing, it all starts to make sense. And you've got the team, pardon the pun, but they're all rowing in the same direction. Thank you, Anne. So having set the direction, focus, and the culture of the organization. Um, it'd be jolly nice if we could just sit back there and wait for the year end, but the reality is um, we do need to monitor what's going on. Um, today in the UK, it's a very snow and cold day. So I've been monitoring that by turning our cold out, because I work from home, and uh, whether to put the heating on, and then if it got a bit too warm, turn the heating down. That's, that's about monitoring what's happening, the reality. So how can we apply that to a team? Um, well, one way is to ensure that you have regular communication with your team. And a good way of doing that is to plan and make part of your work schedule regular one-to-one, -one, face to face meetings. Or if you're a virtual team, you can use Skype, Google Hangouts. There's lots of ways of doing it. But the important thing is to have a conversation. Um, and for example, in my one-to-ones with my teams, um, I initially set them every fortnight because um, we agreed that every week was just too time-consuming and too regular. People haven't had the chance to go away and do something. So we'd look at the tasks that they were working on and whether the priorities were right and if they wanted any help and advice or indeed an opportunity to give me an update. But on the second fortnightly visit, I asked them to bring to the meeting also their agreed objectives um, and we looked at um, what evidence that they'd gathered to show that they were actually heading in that direction. Uh, and on the subject of evidence, um, I did encourage the team to gather evidence of good performance and um, people often say to you, thank you very much indeed. And um, that was a really good job, Fred, Mary, whatever. And um, well, why not say to the person, well, uh, if you really appreciate it, uh, perhaps you could do me just a massive favor. Would you please just drop me an email or my boss um, to that effect and copy me in? Now then you can pop that email in your evidence. And then when it comes to writing out your report and or contributing to it, that gives clear evidence that you can support you while working towards it. And the other side applies too. Sometimes things don't work out well. It would be wonderful if everything worked out as planned, but sometimes it just doesn't. Reality overtakes and there are legitimate reasons why you weren't able to. So for example, uh, you, another priority might come in which means you just aren't able to plan any time. So by talking on your one-to-ones, I'm not going to be able to get to that. Is that okay? Bosses don't like surprises. Customers don't like surprises. 
So communication is key here. Uh, and again, giving that guidance so that they understand their own competencies. And um, just quickly on the, the subject of uh, constructive feedback, um, I think feedback has to be fair, firm, uh, and honest as well. Um, so uh, coming back to that statement earlier on, um, careful with my criticism, liberal with my praise. And tell the truth, but don't over-egg it. And if there are areas for development, don't be afraid to say what they are. But instead of saying what they are, why not ask the person on the other end of the table, how do you think you've got on? What's gone well? What do you think you might have done better and what have you learned? Isn't it a great, a great feeling when the person that feels they can say to you, well, actually, I wish I'd done it a different way? Because half the time they're beating themselves up far worse than they need to. And actually, as a boss or a leader or a team leader, what you can do is say, well, let's put that into context and what we learned. And, and then you can guide and coach and mentor the person so that they improve. And I've seen people in my team go on to get qualified promotions and move on to other jobs because they built their levels of competence, skills and knowledge. So managing the performance and communicating, I would say, are critical success factors. Um, I put together here um, four um, example um, high impact questions and um, I'll just quickly go through them and then I thought and perhaps the fourth one we could ask people to put on what they think about it and um, pop some answers in. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, what are the key characteristics of the best team you have ever worked for or with? So I'll just keep talking, guys, while you just pop some answers onto the chat line there. I just want to quickly trot through these questions. And um, there's various ways you can do this. Um, uh, you, can, you could have a team meeting and say, right, we're just going to just get the conversation, almost like an icebreaker. Um, so I thought a question that we just discussed for 10 minutes, and it's an open discussion, I'd just like to hear what you have to say. So how does this team measure success? And, and again, don't forget, you've got your charter, so you know what behavior is about honesty, integrity, respecting other people's views, listening. So how does this team measure success? And what are the unspoken rules and rituals of this team? That, that's quite a good question, I think. And how does this team make decisions? So let's come back to the final one. What are the key characteristics of the best team you ever worked, uh, worked for or with? Okay, well, some of the answers I've got on here are, oh, there's a relaxed environment. It's very supportive. Uh -huh. um, someone else is saying that they bring treats along to the meeting, which kind of uh -huh. helps, which I think is a nice uh -huh. idea. So it, it seems to be a lot of very positive, relaxed atmosphere. Those kind of points seem to be what people like working, um, how people uh -huh. like to work in a team. Yeah, and I think there's things like... Um, you can sort of sense when people, they know what they're doing. You, you, you can't touch it. You, cannot, you can almost feel it when you walk into a team. And there's not a, there's not a sense of that calmness is reflected because people know what they're doing. They know what, what their role is, what's expected of them. Uh, and they know what timetables. And, you, you know, you, they're not having to be nagged or chased, etc. So that's some of the good things. Just on this slide a little bit longer, I thought... Um, the, the quality of the answers is in the quality of the questions, as, as I guess is my key point. And um, so I thought, what, how should we ask these questions? So I thought, keep your questions short, simple, and appropriate. Do ask where, who, and how. And, and just a suggestion here, please be careful with why. There's just a risk that it could sound parental and put some people on the defensive. So just be careful with that one. And, um, and be careful with those leading questions too. You know, we've all done it, uh, and um, I'm no saint either, and occasionally you slip into it. Um, don't you think it would be a good idea if? Well, actually then perhaps you're just stamping your opinion on it. And especially if you're the boss, it's quite difficult for people not to agree with you. So if you're looking for a discussion, which is two people contributing, that's possibly one to avoid. And less is more. And I think the final point I would like to make is um, 
try and be a great listener and I'm a chatterbox. I find it challenging um, but I know my area of development and I, I, I take active points to try and listen actively. The few, uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes one little trick somebody told me was if you, if you tend to interrupt, because that actually is a sign that you're not really listening, you're busy working on your next answer, in your head repeat what the person just said to you, the last few words, and that actually stops you interrupting and it makes you really listen carefully. So that's some uh, example of high impact questions, Anne. So on the next slide I thought I'd give some recommended reading. Um, um, and the, the older I get, the more I read and the more I learn. And the more, more I learn, the more I know I need to learn, if that makes sense. So um, a lot of people will have read, I'm hoping, the Myth Revisited. Um, but I still think it's worth a reread. I've read it about three or four times or so. <clears throat> and it's, all, it's by Michael e, e, e. Gerber and uh, Gerber. He says, why small businesses don't work and what to do about it. And uh, it's in a great sport story type format. And uh, it's almost parables and about how you're learning. So a really good read. And it shows the power of putting in together systems and processes and building your organization now to the size that you expect it to be in years to come. Now, I'm not suggesting that you start off by walking in and hiring 50 people. But at least in your mind, have an organization chart of what it is and what the roles are. If you're a single man band, it would be quite an interesting exercise to write that organization chart down and just see how many roles you're fulfilling. It's not just sales, it's finance, it's admin, it's marketing, social media, and it, the end is, the list is endless. Um, talking of social media, um, I'm, I'm quite a newbie to social media. I only started really looking at it about nine months ago. And uh, once somebody recommended this book to me, Know Me, Like Me, Follow Me by Penny Power, and uh, it really did refresh my thinking about social media. Uh, and I get it. Uh, and it's about building relationships. And you know, the world of the hard sell is no more. It, it, I, I hardly believe that it's about working with people and getting to know people. Um, and then you tend to, if people like you, then people will do business with you. Um, so that's really a good read for people on the social media side. And then a great book by Michael Neal on the um, on both life coaching and business coaching is you can have what you want, and he's got this fantastic grid um, with nine reasons of what's stopping you. And um, have a look at that. You can have a free, we, a free peek on Amazon, and the grid <coughs> talks about what's stopping you, and it could be your self beliefs, so it could be fear, it could be a person, but. It kept, I believe you me, whenever it's stopping you, you will recognize in at least one of those sections of the grid. And as, my, as Paul McKenna said, says, it will change your life. So I hope you enjoy reading those books. Um, and just before we finish there, and I think it's probably a good idea to take some questions. Okay, so we have had one question in from somebody who wants to know, you know, if you're leading a team, how can you get some feedback on how good you are as a leader? Right. I thought that was well, a great question. I, I think that's a very good question because even leaders need reassurance and you're only thinking in it, right? Um, well, the, the, there are a number of ways and it's, for example, in the one-to-ones. Um, what I developed was a question that I can't, I, I can't say I made this up. Um, I got it from somebody else, but I just thought it was such a great thing to do. So I would have the meeting with the, the individual and, and at the end of the meeting which was all about them and their progress etc I said um, and asked them to help me and because uh, I'm hopefully I'm doing the right things as a leader manager in support and enabling them um, but is there anything else I can do which will help me be a better manager for you yes so you asked, mentioned you mentioned uh, to me I think once how can I support you better I, I like that phrase that's it. very good yeah how can I support you better thank you and that, that is exactly how, how I put it uh, how, how can I support you better and that got people thinking because it's not a threat yeah and, and people don't feel uncomfortable because they're helping me and I don't feel threatened when somebody comes back to me and says, well it would be really good because 
people, generally speaking, don't want to turn around and say a nasty thing to say, well, you know, for example, one of I, I wanted I wanted a lot of reassurance in the early days, and one of my team said to me, well, one way you could support me better is um, perhaps we could, because uh, I know you need to know what's going on. Perhaps we could have sort of certain times we can get together, or we could do it once a week, or if you want to be kept informed, let me know right at the beginning, will you? And then they made some terrific suggestions, which gave me peace of mind and allowed them to get on with their jobs. And another technique that I have used is um, I, I've done this with a team, and I, I get the team to write this question at the top of the paper. And it was a phrase that you just said, how can I support you better? And they, I asked them there to write that question and then put their own name next to it. And then pass the paper to the person on their right. So imagine six people on the, ta on the table. So six people are going to look at the other six people and, and give that answer to everybody around the table. And they're allowed to put a line in, just a line, a few words, but they can't put it in the same point that's already been written. So it's a bit of pass the parcel. Um, write your point, okay, you've got a minute, pass it on, next one. So you, you end up with a list with your name on it and suggestions from, so we say, the other six members of the teams of how you can support them better. And okay. what's happening then is the whole team is getting it, as well as yourself. Uh, yeah, another technique I've come across, uh, and I've used it myself actually, is this whole idea of 360 degree feedback, whereby, you know, you ask your people in the team to give feedback on you, and also you ask your peers and um, your own boss, so getting, getting it from all directions. Uh, yeah, I think you have to have a lot of trust to be able to do that as well. I've noticed from other people doing it too that it's not much good having it as a tick box exercise because that doesn't really tell you anything. So you need to have maybe open questions. So it's just another thing to think about maybe, you know, it can be useful. Yeah. Okay, I think... I think the common point yeah. there is about knowing yourself, isn't it, Anne? Being honest with yourself. Yes, it's a very good point, Dave. Mm, thank you. Okay, I think we'll move on because we're running uh, towards uh, the end of our hour now. Um, and you have something to... Um, to give to our listeners. Yes, I do. I want to share a couple of things with the listeners. Um, first of all, I'd like to say a special thank you. Thank you to you, Anne. Uh, and thanks for this opportunity. And, uh, and it's been an absolute pleasure uh, working with you because we've worked as a little mini team, haven't we, in producing this. Uh, and, it's, and it's been really good. I've enjoyed tremendously working with you. And, and, uh, and I've enjoyed giving the presentation because it's great to share, give to gain. Um, I've just finished an ebook, and it's called Business Growing Pains and How to Avoid Them. And um, th this can retail for about £13, but um, if people go to my website, um, they can download it for free. So that would be nice. And it gives, um, uh, there's about 13 chapters, um, and they're very short because people are busy, and it's giving some te uh, techniques on various things about affect people who are growing. That, that it could be a new business. Or we could be just moving on to the next step. And the first 13 that do apply, um, I've got a special offer uh, about a one-to-one -one session that I'm ready to do with them, and, and I will contact them directly. Um, but most of all, thank you. Thanks, Anne, and thanks okay. to people for listening. I really do appreciate it. Okay, that's very good of you, Dave. And that, that's there are your numbers there if people want to get in contact. We'll be putting this presentation up on SlideShare afterwards. There'll be a link on, I'm sure, on David's website. And um, also, that's my website too. You'll be able to pick it up from there. Uh, practical management skills. And if you'd like to be informed of the next webinar that, that's happening, then just take a moment maybe to subscribe there on the right-hand side, and you'll be the first to hear about the next webinar when it's arranged. So I'm I'd like subscribing. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Well, thanks a million, uh, Dave. It was a really interesting and informative uh, webinar. Lots of um, great tips. It's amazing how you know every time I I bring on a speaker, they all have a different perception on leadership and a different angle. And you know you can always be learning new ideas. So I really appreciate the time you've put into this. I'd like to thank our audience for for joining us this evening and for contributing so well. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Good evening to you, Ben.